Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Professor Ajaz Ahmed and we're going to discuss the recent summit that took place in Helsinki between President Trump and President Putin. Ajaz, the summit has taken place in rather odd circumstances where uh, the, the United States agencies have filed cases against 12 Russian intelligence officials and this is the backdrop of Russia supposedly helping Trump win the elections within which this uh, summit has taken place. Do you think that has adversely affected the summit? Um, I mean, <laughs> respond directly to the question, the uh, 12 Russian diplomats. And um, the timing was very interesting. Three days before his Helsinki, they do that. Um, well, but the, the master stroke, uh, Putin's master stroke during the press conference came exactly on that. He said there is a treaty between the United States and us for handling such matters. So Mr. Mueller can just send an official request to us uh, to, um, and they can come in, even if uh, a representative of Mr. Mueller can sit on that. Uh, and uh, question and uh, our people and so on. But we also, of course, ask for reciprocity. And so on. <laughs> so so he, he said, let, let me, Muna sent me <laughs> a request and I will let, let him interrogate these people any time because we have a treaty. So, so far as that is concerned. So that's an interesting point. Reciprocity means, therefore, that they also get to examine what the evidence is supposed to be? No, is no, that... no. He, he, he actually mentioned a whole case. Okay. That there was somebody by the, by the name of Bowden <laughs> who had made a million and a half <laughs> in Russia and paid no taxes on them, <laughs> either in Russia or in the United States. <laughs> and uh, contributed 400,000 or something like that <laughs> to Hillary Clinton campaign. <laughs> so he, he said he, he, has, he has absconded from us. He made money here. <laughs> he didn't pay any taxes and we want to interrogate him as to what the whole cycle is where he makes money here, pays no taxes, just runs away, contributes to the Clinton um, election fund. The election fund. And we just want to know. Uh, we, we would like to interrogate people like that. And he said there have been 190 such requests and we have always uh, worked it out. So Mr. Mayor can just send me <laughs> So, so far as that particular episode is um, Generally, my view of the subject is that things of that sort did not. Uh, um, did not at all affect the summit. This thing of the whole of the U.S. establishment, official and non-official, that is to say the whole media, and I must say, Praveen, that the liberal left in the United States refers to Putin exactly the way the most far-right people do. This whole language of dictator and thug and killer and this, that, and the other. It's a broad consensus on when it comes to talking to Putin, you know, so so th this thing was held in defiance of all of that. I was saying to you, I think last time, the time before, that everything that Trump is doing is geared towards his next, his reaction. All of this is addressed to his base. Therefore, look at the timing. It's beautiful. He goes to the G7, insults them all. Then he goes to NATO, insults them all, pay up, then this is protection money, etc. Exactly what he's, he was saying during his campaign. And immediately after that, he goes to Helsinki. And for the first time in his public life since the elections, he, he talks sense. <laughs> which, is a, which is quite strange. 
and no wonder the American official media is so upset. He was subdued. He read from a written text. text. He was subdued, then asked questions. He took on the American media. The American media tried to make, to, to you know, they, they were briefed. You must not talk. Let them talk about substantive issues. You must focus on this and embarrass them. He just took them on, breaking all protocol on Russian soil. He denounced the American intelligence agencies, this, that, and the other. Now, the American establishment is jumping up and down. Brennan, who was the, um, the CIA chief uh, under the NSA chief, I think, under Obama, is saying that this is treason. This is treason. You know? Yes. And, I mean, the whole of the American media severed, was trying to sever, sever all the, the, the actual discussion uh, to focus on this. And they thought they were going to embarrass them. Yes, do you remember any time in history, yours and mine, yours longer than mine, that we have a scenario where there's such a consensus in the United States across, cutting across party lines, that peace with Russia is not on the table. And any understanding on arms, any understanding on larger engagements, West Asia, any other place, is not to be discussed with the, with the Russians. And these are two nuclear powers who have the capacity to destroy the globe a number of times. Do you remember such a scenario? I honestly cannot see this kind of consensus. Because as you say, my history, you know, my history is longer than yours. Uh, just, a, just a little. What is new? You know, during, you know, when the USSR was alive and well, this sort of thing was going, was going on all the time. They have to give us this, that, and the other. This is the framework, otherwise we won't talk to them, etc., etc. We must not talk to them. What is there to talk to these people, etc.? Oh, this is going on. What's new is that the president doesn't believe that. So, <laughs> that, that, that is what, what is crazy. <laughs> the U.S. presidents those times used to take seriously the fact that this is a strategic consensus. There is an intersystemic rivalry between capitalism and socialism. We cannot, you know, etc., etc. It was real. So, so there was the consensus was much bigger. On the one hand. There used to be this rationality that sooner or later you have to talk to it. But condition this, condition that. Condition. Yeah, but there was a post the Cuban crisis, there was an acceptance that there is no way we can really defeat the Soviet Union. And therefore, there has to be some arms discussion, some limitation, some hotline, and so on. The so called but, success of the mutually assured destruction policies that, that flow from that. You see, I mean, what has happened in the United States is that, you know, there is, it's so ideologically driven um, that they no longer have a view of what their actual strategic interests are. Uh, the entire liberal left Democratic Party, everybody in the United States is, now has one uh, point program, which is denounce, uh, to denounce Trump, whatever he does, etc. Et so actually what has happened in the United States is that there is a very general collapse of politics. When the Soviet Union was there, the United States actually had a very, very competent diplomatic, intelligence, political establishment, which knew how to behave, as you rightly said, after Cuba, uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, and 
Um, you know, after Khrushchev uh, sort of, you know, talked about the coexistence of two systems and so on, peaceful coexistence and so on, the Americans understood that, that, that in their direct thing, there has to be, uh, you know, uh, containment, this, that, and the other, but the hot wars would be fought on the peripheries it, in, in the third world. That's right. You know, there would be no war there. And so there, there were certain norms. But with NATO expansion to the east, the Baltic states, Poland, positioning of uh, anti-ballistic ballistic missiles, this is really changing. You see, this is, this is what I meant by saying that there were norms. When the President of the United States gives an undertaking, whether written or not, that NATO will not move one inch beyond its present boundaries towards Russia. And then you break that. And you know, so there are no norms. The earlier period, and the Soviet Union really was there, what happened with the, with the collapse of the Soviet Union is that the arrogance of American power become, became uncontrolled. And now, now it has been un uncontrolled for 25 years. And now it cannot perceive the fact that during this period, the balance of power has shifted, is shifting in a way even more dramatic than when the Soviet Union was there. And this is the yeah. new reality which the U.S. establishment is not willing to accept or recognize, and they yes. think they can change it. Yes, because of these 25 years of, you know, this arrogance of imperial sovereignty that they have exercised all over the world um, with the fall of the Soviet Union, they no longer have uh, that kind of government which understands that there are constraints if you remember Beyond this you cannot go the, why the world has changed the current strategic doctrine talks about revisionist powers that china and russia are revisionist powers so that right. they're challenging our hegemony and that's yeah. actually something which cannot be accepted you know you know uh, Prabhi, I, I was reading some of putin's speeches over the last one year in one of them, he details the what has been gained in Russia since he came to power. And then there are pages and pages of what has happened in terms of the improvement of the, um, you know, the weapon systems in, the, in, in Russia, the etc. and that there are now levels of cutting technology that Russia has that are far beyond what the United States has now. This is also yeah. interesting because that's with only a 10% of the defense budget that the U.S. has. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. And you know, it, it, it's, it is so interesting to be reading those speeches. Those speeches are they, they remind you of the kind of speeches that Nehru and um, Nasser used to make about how to develop your country. Entire things about development of Russia. And the role of the state about this, that, or the other, but I won't go into all that. The point that I was trying to make is that at the point where Russia has arrived militarily, if this economic alliance between Russia and China becomes also a military alliance, then the fate of the United States is sealed. As a global hegemon. See, yes. So they're as close as that. And interestingly, both Brzezinski and Kissinger had warned that Russia and China should be kept apart. Kissinger saying at one point, we are tilting towards China today, but 25 years later, we might need to tilt to the other side. So that was, that was his... I suspect that this particular summit has in its backdrop 
about perhaps half a dozen closed door sessions between Trump and Kissinger. <laughs> Trump by himself, you think that Trump by himself could not have come to this realization? No, you see, you see I mean, for, for one thing, I know for a fact, it's a, it's a very known fact that uh, Trump has been having these closed door meetings with Kissinger over the last three or four months. Uh, I think it's Kissinger's tutoring of tutoring that, look, Europeans are vessels. You just have to tell them to shape up. And they follow. But uh, Russia, you must not offend. You must make friends with Russia. There are major points of contention between Russia and China. You should not create a situation in which the two powers decide to set all of that aside and make far greater, closer allies, etc. The, 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 the point that you were making to keep them apart. So this whole cultivation of Russia, and it is so dramatic to me, at least after he went and insulted all his allies, both on the economic front and on the military front, and then becoming, then going there and, uh, you know, talking like a decent person who's come to see him because he has some problems to solve. So it's in Russia. Uh, it's, it's very striking. Uh, and I think there's some, there's, there's a method to this man, this particular thing, there's a method to this man. That there's a strategic thinking that he has been made aware of from outside the, um, the existing uh, consensus in, in the US intelligence and other services. Do you also think that this is also one of the reasons that in South Syria now, uh, the Syrian government has had a more or less easy victory. It seems now that they have been able to clear out Dara and some of the other places. They are coming up to Jolan, uh, the, the, the line which Israel has said, well, they have to keep that distance, otherwise you can come up to uh, what is the sort of yeah. no man's land between Israel held Jolan and Syrian, Israel occupied Jolan and the Syrian, uh, uh, Syrian territory. Yeah. So do you think that's a part of this understanding? I mean, you know, it is very interesting. Um, uh, it, during their press conference, Trump talked very responsibly about the degree of cooperation there has been between the U.S. and Russia in containment of ISIS. Of ISIS, of ISIS. Uh, and so, and that the, the Russians have been very constructive in, in that uh, partnership. And then when it came to the question of Syria, it's very interesting. Uh, in a very restrained manner, Trump stated the U.S. position that we have to, we are the oldest and the closest friends. We have to support uh, Israel's needs for security, etc. We are going to do that. And Putin said the objective is to separate the forces, Syrian and Israeli forces, to the status quo armed, and immediately went to. Um, that will help resolve the humanitarian question. And I have spoken to President Macron the other day, and we have decided to deliver, and Russia has offered these huge airplanes, their plans to bring in the humanitarian aid. Basically saying separation of forces 
and this humanitarian thing and bringing the refugees back to settle them back in Syria is going to go on between us and, and Europe and you can join if you want. Yeah. And Trump was completely restrained on all of that. This yeah. is a significant step in Syria. Yeah. Because yeah, and this is a very significant uh, thing that we want that separation. Which is a polite way of saying that if you don't agree to it, we'll do it militarily. Yeah. And at the same time, we are cooperating with Europeans. Because, you know, that means that the more refugees that they come back, the fewer of them then go to Europe. And therefore, we are coordinating it with Europe. And the point is, we, 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 either you come into the game or not. It still leaves the question of east of Euphrates, what's going to happen, the Altanaf enclave, which the US still controls. And of course, the yeah. northern borders, which is Kurd, Kurdish yeah. and Turkey. Yeah. 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 So that yeah. still yeah. remains. Right. The, 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 you see, what is impressive is the non belligerent tone. Okay. And at the same time, and some, somebody's, uh, some uh, correspondent asked about trust. Putin was. was almost angry. He said, where did you get the idea that there is trust? I am the president of Russia. I defend the interests of, of the Russian Federation. He is the president of the United States. He defends the interests of the United States. There is a question of trust. What are you asking? You know, it is quite, quite a performance. <laughs> so, you know, in other words, we have all kinds of differences. We are not going to, those we talk about in, behind closed doors, but some of the lines we are taking here are the lines. Um, I mean, the Trump says, we will do what, we will support whatever Syria, uh, Israelis say is their security interest. And to that extent, Russia and Syria have reciprocated by not having Iranian troops in this particular operations. And neither has Iran too much of an interest to want to get in over there as long as their strategic interests are served, which is clearing that area of uh, ISIS. Very good on that. Uh, he said, he said uh, uh, whether or not Iran the question of Iranian presence in Syria has nothing to do with me. It's for the uh, Syrian government to, to decide. That's not nothing. Uh, it's not a matter uh, under my control. Iran still uh, remains an open if, 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 if Syria wants the Iranians to stay, they us stay. Uh, However, there is, yes, Bashar al-Assad, on the other hand, has said, yes, of course, I let, um, I completely guarantee that Iran is go out of Syria. Uh, but for that to happen, uh, Israel has to vacate the Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> it's an occupation of our territory. Yes. <laughs> world might have forgotten it, but the Syrians can't. <laughs> and Iran's situation still remains unresolved. The Iran sanctions, what yeah. Trump is doing on that, that doesn't seem to have been resolved in any way in this in this no. summit. No, that no. still remains. Except there. that again, what is important is not just the resolution, in my view. Uh, I think what is very important is that. In that press conference, which is the only thing I'm going by. Yes, of course. Because, because the, what the media says is just, you know, that's not where you can get in news or interpretation. That news or interpretation has disappeared from the media. So, there it was very interesting. Um, 
both sides has taken their position. Um, in in the way which is proper to such press conferences, to which I mean Trump has never observed those protocols. That's what's important here. Putin said it is the most controlled country in the world. Uh, its entire um, nuclear programs completely under control. And he used, he used that phrase, the most controlled country in the world. And it was the best um, agreement. And we must support this as long as we can. And Trump said what? You see, big things you cannot expect to be destroyed. And whatever has been said, even if somebody has moved here a little bit here and there in the uh, real negotiations, they're not going to be revealed. Uh, but the very fact that in the teeth of the entire establishment of India, to the point that Fox News, etc., are going crazy criticizing Trump for what he did in Helsinki, rightly, far right, is in enraged. Their official media is enraged. Only Steve Bannon is happy. <laughs> so, there is a serious um, So, you know, it's it, that far gone. So he went there in the teeth of all of that um, and himself restrained himself from his usual religions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ajaz. I think this has been a very interesting discussion. And Trump, at least what he will do is make changes in the way American presidents have behaved, if nothing else. <laughs> So, so every, every engagement of this kind is going to provide us with some discussion, material for discussion and focus. Thank you, Ajaz, for being with us. We hope to see you again I, as, as these things develop and Mr. Trump continues to entertain and enrage us. Yeah. See you, Kareem. So, bye-bye. Thank you, Ajaz, and hope to see you again. This is all the time we have for News Click today for this episode. Do keep watching future episodes on News Click, visit our YouTube page and also our webpage.